And suddenly something grabbed me and pulled me out of my body. I found myself falling through the air down this long tunnel and it was getting hotter and hotter and darker and darker. I was fully awake and cognizant just like I'm standing here now. The first thing I noticed was the intense heat. It was far beyond the ability to sustain life. I wondered, how could I be alive in this place? I looked up and I saw these two demons in the cell. They were reptilish in appearance, but they were pacing in the cell like a vicious, caged animal. They had an extreme hatred for God and they were blaspheming God. But the one demon grabbed me, picked me up, threw me into the wall of this prison cell like I weighed the weight of a water glass. I collapsed. I felt as if every bone in my body had broken. It's real literal pain you're going to feel in hell. And then this other demon that was in the cell grabbed me, picked me up from behind, dug its claws in my chest, and just tore the flesh open. And these demons have no mercy over you whatsoever. They have an extreme hatred for mankind. People just look like skeletons. You cannot distinguish a man from a woman. It looked like flesh hanging off their bones. And the screams were so loud and deafening. Demons have a disgusting, foul odor to them, a rotting smell to them, and also mm. the smell of burning flesh. So you, you have to eat, fight for even the tiniest bit of oxygen. And I'm going to demonstrate to you, this is how you breathe in hell. And some people were in these individual pits and the fire would rage up on them and burn their flesh off and they would scream in agony. Living right is a fruit of your salvation. Treating people with kindness is a fruit of your salvation. Doing good works is a fruit of your salvation. If you don't have that, then, you know, get it. So. Y'all have been really asking me to react to a health testimony by a, a specific person, Bill Weiss. Now, I've seen, of course, I've seen his videos. I just haven't reacted to him, but I know you guys have been asking for it, so I wanted to go ahead and give it to y'all. Look, a lot of his videos have millions of views, so I wanted to find one that maybe you guys hadn't seen, so it has like 100,000. Maybe you've seen it, maybe you didn't. Um, but I, I think it's funny because I wanted to say my audience is like split into three. Like there's some people that watch this channel that they don't believe any of the testimonies. Like they don't believe them at all. They just think they're interesting. And some of them may be Christians. Some of them may be uh, uh, non-believers. I think it's crazy that some non-believers watch my channel, but hey, it's dope, honestly. Um, and a lot of the people say they don't believe the testimonies because they're like, well, how could anybody go to hell? How can anybody go to hell and come back? You can't do that. Well, I mean, technically people can't die and come back, right? But people die in hospitals all the time and they're clinically dead and then they come back. Now, I don't know exactly what's going on, whether it's, you know, a vision or, you know, whether they, they actually went there or whatever, whatever it is. But you don't know what it is either. And there's clearly room for this in the Bible. I mean, Paul didn't even know if he came out of his body. Paul saw a vision of the afterlife. I mean, you, you say you can't go to hell and come back. Well, I mean, you can't go to heaven and come back either. But God is showing them something. There's people that watch it just because they're entertained, but they don't really believe it. None of them. There's some people that live by him. Like I, I saw a comment, a, a comment on one of my videos saying, I don't even read the Bible. I just get my information from hell testimonies, heaven and hell testimony. I was like, what? Do not let these testimonies be your Bible. They're interesting to listen to. And some of them are eye opening. And yeah, some of them I believe, but yo, this is not a replacement for the Bible at all. Get in the word. That's the word of God. What are you watching these for if you don't even read the Bible? And there's some of them that are just in between. They know that they use their discernment. They understand that there are actors in this world. No matter if you can look in their eyes and see that they're telling the truth. There's actors out here, really good actors, professional or non-professional. People lie. So you have to use your discernment. And God doesn't just want us to believe everything that we hear. And he doesn't want us to just slander everything we hear either. He wants us to test the spirits behind what we're hearing that's in scripture so they're good to listen to they're entertaining but don't just live by them and don't just write them off and bill weiss in the beginning of this video he kind of goes over that and so i'm going to play a little bit of it and there's a part where i'm going to stop it because you know there's a part where the lord has put it on my heart to kind of talk about this i've talked about it in like two videos ago but i want to talk about it again because it's such a big argument in the Christian community. Like Christians are divided. I don't, I don't believe God's happy with the church. Now, of course, it's cool to debate and you know things like that. But when you hate the other side and you just hate what they're saying uh, because they, they believe in a different doctrine, that's where the line's drawn. Debate is good, but hate is not. Let's just go ahead and uh, get into the video.
November 23rd, 1998, I had an experience that changed my life. It doesn't matter if you believe my experience. What matters is that you check out what the Bible has to say about hell and avoid it just the same. This was not a near-death experience. This was an out-of-body experience that's classified as a vision in the Bible. In 2 Corinthians 12, 2, Paul, when he was caught up into heaven in a vision, he said whether in the body or out of the body, he didn't know. Well, the Lord showed me that I left my body. So in a vision, you can travel. Like Paul and John actually traveled to heaven in their spirit bodies. 1 Corinthians 15, 44 talks about... That's in the Bible. But according to some of you guys, that can't happen, right? But it happened in the Bible. I think some of you guys just don't know Scripture. But a natural body and a spirit body. And in Ezekiel chapter 8, he was picked up by his hair, carried from Babylon to Jerusalem in a vision. He was told to eat. He experienced the sweetness of the food in his stomach. He wept. He conversed. My point is, in a vision, you can experience the same things in your spirit body that you would in your physical body. And this is not to compare my experience with any of the great men of the Bible. I'm just trying to give you a scriptural basis of how this can occur for a Christian. The only way a Christian can see hell uh, is in a vision or a dream. And in Job 7, 14, it says, You scare me with dreams and terrify me through visions. Isaiah 21, 2, he was given a grievous vision. And in Job 4, 14, Eliphaz was given a vision that caused his bones to shake. So you can have a grievous, terrifying, bone-shaking vision. Now, um, you know, this vision, well, I'll get to that. But um, you might say, Bill, why do I need to hear about hell? I'm a Christian. I'm not going there. Well, three quick reasons why it's important for us as Christians to hear about hell. Number one, when you understand how severe hell is, you'll be much more appreciative of your own salvation from what you were saved from. Because a lot of Christians believe in a teaching called annihilationism. And that's a teaching that says you simply cease to exist if you deny Jesus. But that's not true. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 46, these should go in everlasting life and these should go in everlasting punishment. And the word everlasting is the word ionios. So just as heaven is everlasting, so is hell everlasting. You'll thank God he saved you from this horrible place. Number two, it causes us as Christians to walk more in the fear of the Lord. What is the fear of the Lord? Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 17 says the fear of the Lord is to simply read his word daily and to obey his word daily that you have enough respect for Almighty God that will obey Him. It's not enough to say, yeah, I'm a Christian, and go do your own thing. We're supposed to obey God, and that if you have the fear of the Lord, you will want to walk the straight walk. You will not want to... All right, so this is where I want to stop it real quick. And then, and after I get through with this, I want to um, just play the rest of the video and maybe stop it minimally. But this is really important. How we said that. Some people think that Christians cannot go to hell. Christians, true Christians, a real Christian... I shouldn't have to say that, but a Christian, no, there won't be one Christian in hell, but there will be Christians in hell. Just, have, just saying a one-time proclamation of faith when you were eight years old, it's not faith. If you just continue to live your life however you want, and then never even think about God and think about how he wants you to live. And the thing is, one of my last videos was, is that if you have true faith, your fruit, you will have fruit, and you will have works. Again, those works are not saving you by any means, but I wanted to read some scripture that I did not read in the last video because some people still have arguments. I don't understand. How can you deny this scripture? Like you, you pick and choose what you want to listen to. It's like, I'll listen to that, but I, no, I don't know. Or you'll twist that. When it's, it, it's, it's simple. Like a, a kindergartner can understand this. I mean, it's, it's straightforward. I mean, so check this out. Right here, it says uh, Philippians 2 verse 12. Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I am away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. Work hard showing the results of your salvation. Obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you. He's continually working. You know, sanctification is a process. Giving you the desire and the power to do what he pleases. So, clearly right there... The results of your salvation will be shown through your works. Are those things saving you? No. People are like, what are works? Works are things that you do. Whether they're good or bad, you, you can have good works or bad works. They're things that you do, okay? And one thing you could say is like, if, if, if it's a work or not, hey, can I do that enough to make it to heaven? No. You can't do anything enough to make it to heaven. You have to have faith, true faith. So if you do not have works, your faith is dead. And, and, and it even says that in this scripture right here. Check it out. James 2, verse 14, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? I think not. And then down here uh, in verse 17, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So it's clearly saying that if you have faith, if you proclaim that you have faith but there's no works, then you need to examine yourself because you probably don't have true faith. Because how can you know what Jesus died on the cross for you and just live how you want? It, you can't do that when the Holy Spirit's in you. 
like you, you can't just do that. And then um, I also wanted to read this verse real quick. It said, uh, it's John 15, verse 8. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciple. Your fruit, your works are proof that you are generally saved, genuinely saved, excuse me. If you don't have these, you're just saying that you, that you have faith. Look, guys, I could say that I'm a woman. Hey, I'm a woman. What you going to say? I'm a woman. And we know people do that. But it does not make me a woman. Same thing with Christians. You could say you're a Christian, but that doesn't mean you're a Christian. It's deeper than just believing in. For, go to the Greek. Go to the Hebrew. Go to the actual, actual uh, original language it was written in. It's, it's deeper than what we think in our language believe in is. It's really believe on, trust in, cling to. That's what it is. So a lot of Christians... A lot of Christians, not real Christians, Christians are going to hell because they're not truly saved. That's why I'm playing this video for you guys. And some of you guys will be like, well, no Christian's going to hell. Well, then what is a lukewarm Christian? Why will God spit them out their mouth? You don't think that they believed that he just died on the cross and that was the extent of it? They just relied on their works but didn't have any true faith? What is Revelation 3 talking about? Revelation 3 verse 15, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. He's talking to Christians there. People that thought that they were saved. People that just proclaimed that they were saved. So what Bill Weiss is saying in here is, is true. How can you live how you want? I'm talking, I'm talking to everybody. I'm talking to myself. I'm talking to everybody. How can you live how you want? Live by the flesh and say that you're saved. I, I just had to get that on my chest. I don't know why there's a disagreement. I literally had someone in my comments. I like debating people in my comments if we have like different, if we believe in different doctrines, that's fine. But this dude was like, he, he was a little bit too much. And then at the end, he said, he had nerve to say that he could do whatever he wants. He doesn't care what God thinks about him because he's saved, because he believes. Well, already right there, that's proven to me that you don't believe at all. Like you don't care what God thinks about you. He said he doesn't care if he pleases God or anything. I'm just like, wow, that's crazy. So people like that, come on, let's get it together. All right, that's it. I'll stop it minimally. Let's get back to the video. Compromise and play around with sin. When you understand how severe hell is, you won't want to do that. Jesus said in Mark 9, 47, if your eye offends thee, the word offend means causes you to sin. He said, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter into life maimed than into hell fire. So the fear of the Lord is something that's so important. And it instills in us the fear of the Lord when you understand how severe hell really is. And, you know, Proverbs 16, 6 says, by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. See, that helps keeping you walk the straight walk. And number three, it'll give us, as Christians, more of a passion for the lost, a desire to want to witness. See, because when you see how severe hell is, you'll think, man, I didn't know it was this bad. I cannot let my family go there or my friends or my neighbor. I've got to do something more than I've been doing. See, we, we pray, but we pray just a, a kind of a weak prayer, honestly. Most don't really take the diligence to pray a fervent, righteous prayer for the unsaved. And when you see how severe hell is, you know, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, and 11, Paul said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Now, even though that scripture is talking about the judgment seat, the reward seat for Christians, the commentaries also point out that he was talking about the judgment and hell in general. So when you understand judgment and hell in general, you'll be more persuasive with men. So you'll get up each day and say, Lord, use me today. Put me in front of somebody today that I can witness to. Lord, I'm available. I am ready to witness, Lord. Uh, put me in front of somebody. You'll have that passion. And maybe now you'll even fast. Fast and pray. You know, how many of us do that? Where you really get on your knees and cry out to God and say, Lord, I'm not letting my family member go to hell. They will not go to hell. I'm going to pray diligently for them. Father, send labors across their path. Lord, open up their heart. Open up their eyes to the truth of the gospel. You'll pray more fervently when you understand how severe hell really is. And uh, if, you, if you're not a Christian, you just need to hear about this because there's only two paths, and uh, we want to make sure you're on the right path. We went to a prayer meeting that we attended every Sunday night. Nothing unusual about the night. At this moment, and this, this was in 1998, I had never studied the topic of hell. I was a Christian for 28 years at that point, and I, was just, I knew it was fiery, and I wasn't going there. But um, we went to this prayer meeting, and you know, I had never studied the hell. I had never had, um, I've never gone to dark movies. I've never drank. I've never taken drugs, and I never had a vision before. And we came home. Went to bed. I got up at 3 o'clock in the morning just to get a glass of water. And I was walking across our living room floor towards the kitchen. And suddenly something grabbed me and pulled me out of my body. Like you're being pulled up out of your body. And I found myself falling through the air down this long tunnel. And it was getting hotter and hotter 
and darker and darker. And I entered this open cavern area as I was falling, and then I landed. Sounds real familiar, doesn't it? I mean, everybody, everybody that I've reacted to or interviewed says that. They start off with that. It's crazy. I landed on a stone floor in a prison cell in hell. Rough-hewn stone walls, bars, filthy, stinking, dirty prison, but like a dungeon. I had no idea how I got there or why I was there. I was fully awake and cognizant, just like I'm standing here now. But Isaiah 24, 22 says, And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison. Proverbs mm. seven twenty seven mentions going down to hell to the chambers of death. And where chambers means inner rooms. Job seventeen sixteen says, They shall go down to the bars of the pit. Jonah 2, 6, the earth with her bars was about me forever. And mm. the Tyndale, the New International, and many other commentaries point out that Jonah himself was at the gates of hell and that it was literal bars and gates. Well, that's where I first found myself. And oh. uh, the first thing I noticed was the intense heat. It was far beyond the ability to sustain life. I wondered, how could I be alive in this place? And my reaction was to get up and run. I just wanted to run out of this prison cell. But I noticed I had no physical strength. It took so much energy to try to move. I thought, what's wrong with my body? But Isaiah 14, 9 and 10 says, Hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at thy coming. They will say, Art thou become weak as we? And Psalms 88, 4 says, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that has no strength. Now, if you ever had the flu and you felt weak, it's a thousand times worse than that. Any movement takes tremendous effort in hell. But see, Acts 17, 28 says, in him we live and move and have our being. So even movement comes from God. It's not automatic. I looked up and I saw these two demons in the cell. They were reptilish in appearance, bumps and scales all over the one's body, a huge jaw. They had claws that were actually about a foot long. Y'all, uh, yeah, like, for real, talk to me real quick. It, put it in the comments. Isn't this crazy how, like, all these people's testimonies line up? And... There's scripture to back it up. Now, not everything. Not, sometimes people, it's kind of extra biblical, biblical, but isn't that crazy? Get right with God, man. Make sure your faith is real. That's the point of this video. And I'm doing it because, because I love y'all. Like, let's get it together, you know? And... These particular two were 12 or 13 feet tall. It's not an exaggeration. There's scripture for that too. But they were pacing in the cell like a vicious, caged animal. They had an extreme hatred for God, and they were blaspheming God. But we know blasphemy comes from the demonic realm. Revelation 13, 6, James 2, 7, and some others. Then they directed this hatred they had for God, they directed towards me. I wondered why. What have I done to them? But the one demon grabbed me, picked me up, threw me into the wall of this prison cell, like I weighed the weight of a water glass. I hit the wall. I collapsed. I felt as if every bone in my body had broken. Now, maybe a spirit doesn't have bones, but it felt like that they were all broken. And now I have to explain one thing. I experienced pain, but I understood most of it was being blocked. I knew that then, but I didn't understand. On the way back, the Lord explained to me that he blocked most of the pain that you would, I would have felt from that. But he wanted me to feel a small amount of it so I could relate to people that it's not metaphorical. It's not a state of the mind. It's real literal pain you're going to feel in hell. Mm. And then this other demon that was in the cell grabbed me, picked me up from behind, dug its claws in my chest. And just tore the flesh open. Again, I'm, how could I be alive through this? I should be dead. And I felt, again, a small amount of the pain. The mountain I felt was enough. But I noticed I had a body. Matthew 10, 28 says, Fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And remember Luke 16, the rich man Jesus talked about. He had a tongue. He wanted a drop of water to cool his tongue. He had a mouth to speak. He had eyes that he lifted. So you have a body in hell. But it withstands these torments. But something else I noticed. There was no blood or water coming from the wounds. It was just all dry. But Leviticus 17, 11 says, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Well, there's no life in hell, so there's no blood. And Zechariah 9, 11 says, I just have to say real quick, he is one of the most biblically literate and knowledgeable people that I've heard, you know, give a testimony. And most people, they, they, they know some stuff in the Bible, but he's just quoting scripture. And I know the scripture too, so it's, it's legit. But that's, uh, that's dope. It says, thy prisoners out of the pit where there is no water. There's not one drop of water in hell. And these demons have no mercy over you whatsoever. They have an extreme hatred for mankind. But see, Psalms 103.17 says, the mercy of the Lord is upon those that fear him. Well, they don't fear him in hell, so you don't derive the benefit of mercy. About this time, it went dark. Now, I believe it was God's presence there to illuminate it so I could see, to describe to people what it looks like. But then he withdrew his light, and it resumed its normal state of absolute pitch black darkness. I mean, you cannot see the hand in front of your face in hell. But Lamentations 3.6 says, He has set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. Jude 13 right. mentions blackness of darkness forever. But mm. it's not just dark. You could actually feel it. 
And that's not an exaggeration. Exodus 10, 21 mentions a darkness that may be felt. Everyone say that. Because it's so wicked and evil and so dark, it, it penetrates through every cell in your body. You know, when I was at a coal mine in, in Arizona, and they took us down on a tour down real deep in the coal mine, and, they, and there was a whole bunch of people, and they turn off the lights for one minute just to give you a, f a feeling of what it's like in the dark. In one minute, people were screaming. They were terrified in one minute because you can't find your way out. You can't see anything, and people were terrified in just one minute. You can imagine in hell, this is for all eternity. Forever. You're enduring all these things. You know, and... Uh, I'm sorry. Sometimes I just get a, a real glimpse of this place, and uh, you, you do not want to go to this place. You never get out. God's so loving, he doesn't want anybody to go. You know? Anyway, I, was, uh, I descended to get there. Um, I ascended when I left. I understood I was down deep in the earth. And uh, there's 49 scriptures that talk about where uh, the current hell is located. I'll just give you two. Ezekiel 26.20 and number 16.32 and 33. It's very clear it's down deep in the earth. Now, I was taken out of this prison cell. And I was placed over next to this large raging pit of fire. This pit was about a mile across with flames raging high up in this open cavern. And it was real literal fire. It wasn't metaphorical or allegorical flames like some teach. No, it was real fire. I felt the heat. I saw the flames. But more importantly, it's what the scripture says. Psalms 11:6 6 says, upon the wicked, he will rain fire and brimstone in a horrible tempest. Psalms 140 verse 10 says, let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire. Real quick, a lot of people tend to say, they say, well, how can it be pitch black? It's one of the arguments. How can it be pitch black in hell if there's fire, if there's flames? And to that, I, I just want to say, don't try to make sense of the spiritual world, the spiritual realm, while you're living in the physical world. It, it won't make sense. And that's clearly stated in a lot of these testimonies where like, it just didn't make sense when they got back. Like, they couldn't really explain it. Like, it, it. It's a different world. It's a different realm. It's not, it's not the same. So who knows? I don't have the answer to that, but the Bible states that it's, it's dark there and that there's also flames. So whatever that means, you probably don't want to find out. <laughs> I mean, we... Uh, In the deep pits. Matthew 13, 49, the angels will sever the wicked from the just and cast the wicked into a furnace of fire. But this is where I could first see people in this pit. There were thousands of people burning. Most of us have never seen a person on fire. Maybe unless you're a fireman. But the people just look like skeletons. You cannot distinguish a man from a woman. It looked like flesh hanging off their bones. And the screams were so loud and deafening. You wanted to get away from the screams, but you couldn't. You had to endure that for all eternity. But see, Isaiah 57, 21 says, There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. There's no peace of mind of any kind in hell. But see, Isaiah 32, 18 says, My people dwell in a quiet resting place. See, quiet, that's a blessing from God, but you're not his people. So you don't, endure, and you don't even enjoy quiet. And, you know, uh, I understood there were different levels of torment and degrees of punishment. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew 23, 14, you shall receive the greater damnation. That infers a lesser damnation. Or Matthew 10, 15, it says, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Well, that infers a less tolerable. Or Hebrews 10, 28 says, of how much worse of a punishment suppose it shall be for you, you who have trodden underfoot the Son of God. There's a worse punishment. But my point is, there is no tolerable, comfortable level in hell. Right. Any level is far worse than your mind can even conceive. I wanted to talk to my wife. I just wanted to let her know. I want to say goodbye. But I understood I'll never have that opportunity. You know, Job 7, 9 says, He that goes down to Sheol shall come up no more. You understand you're not going to get out. And to have no finality with your family, you can't even say goodbye. See, they don't know that you still exist. Death does not mean cease to exist. Death means separation from God. You still exist. You're just down deep in the earth. And to never see your family again and tell them you love them and get to hold them and appreciate them again, you think about that. And for all eternity... You never get to say goodbye. You're just isolated by yourself. You have no purpose, no destiny. It's just a complete useless wasting away. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, There is no work, no device, no knowledge, nor wisdom in Sheol. And it doesn't matter if you're somebody famous here on the earth. No one would know who you are there. You have no identity. Ecclesiastes 6.4 says, Your name is covered in darkness. And you're forgotten in hell. Psalms 88.12, Isaiah 26.4. Yeah, guys, don't try not to focus on the things of this world because every, this world is passing away and everything in it. You know, our goal should be to be with the Lord, should be to follow Christ. That's what a true Christian is. It's a follower of Christ. You can say you're a Christian, but are you following Christ? It's something that you do, like you follow Christ. People just say Christian, throw it around like, you know, there's Christians right now in this strip club every weekend. Just stepping over God in his grace. You can't do that. And 
people are in hell right now. I want to reiterate that because I've said that in a couple videos, but people are in hell right now. Just like he mentioned in the story of, with, you know, of Lazarus and the rich man, he was in Sheol. The rich man was in Sheol, Hades, and the, and 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 uh, Laz uh, and, and Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom at that time. But that's done away with ever since Christ died. But people are in hell right now. Scripture backs that up. So, oh, you know, take it seriously. Make examine yourself. Make sure that you truly have faith. Because because. Yeah, I'm sure some non-believers are going to watch this, but I'm really talking to the Christians, people that proclaim to be Christian. If you're, if you're a Christian and, and, and you know, you really are, then you're good. You're good. This is just entertainment. It's knowledge. Oh, that's where these people going? Hey, fine. But if you're, if, if, if you're an unbeliever and you're a Christian and you know you're not living right, not that living right is what saves you. Living right is a fruit of your salvation. Treating people with kindness is a fruit of your salvation. Doing good works is a fruit of your salvation. If you don't have that, then, you know, get it. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what else to tell you, you know? Deuteronomy 32, 26, Psalm 109, 15, many other verses talk about being forgotten. And um, you, want, you want to talk to a person just to be with people is pleasurable. But see, those people in the pit of fire were all kept at a distance. So you never have conversation again with anybody. You're completely by yourself and isolated for all eternity. Everyone says you know, that. You know, if you go to, a, if they sentence you to a prison today and they put you in solitary confinement, they only leave you for a short time because you'll go crazy because you don't have anybody to talk to. When in hell, you never, ever get to enjoy a person again. The stench in hell is the most foul, putrid, disgusting odors. Remember Jesus rebuked the foul spirits, Mark 9, 25. Demons have a disgusting foul odor to them, a rotting smell to them, and also mm. the smell of burning flesh, and um, also the, the smell of burning sulfur. You know, if you go to Hawaii to the volcano, they actually have signs posted where you cannot go past a certain point because the toxicity of the sulfur coming up from the volcano, it will kill you if you breathe it. It's called sulfur dioxide. Well, sulfur is just another word for brimstone, and the word brimstone is all through the Bible. So you're breathing in this foul putrid, disgusting air that you don't want to breathe. But it's even worse than that because there is not enough air to breathe in hell. So you, you have to eat, fight for even the tiniest bit of oxygen. And I'm going to demonstrate to you, this is how you breathe in hell. And maybe only an asthma person can relate to this, somebody that has asthma, but you breathe like this. It was like, uh, uh, mm. uh. that was as much air as you could get. Well, any moment you feel like you're going to suffocate. Mm. And you have to, that's ongoing for all eternity. But wow. see, Isaiah 42, 5 says, the Lord gives breath to the people upon the earth. You're not upon the earth. You're down deep beneath the earth. God is very specific with his word. You need to sleep in hell. Like we all need sleep, right? If you ever stay up for just two days without going to sleep, try staying up and don't go to sleep at all for two days. You can't even function, right? You're a wreck after two days. Well, in hell, you need to sleep also, but you never get to go to sleep. Revelation 14, 10 and 11 says, and they shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the lamb and in the presence of the holy angels and the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever and they have no rest day nor night. I mean, you can never sleep, but see rest is a blessing from God. Psalms 127, 2 said, the Lord gives his beloved sleep. And Isaiah 57, 20 said, the wicked are like the troubled sea that cannot rest. You know, the sea is always moving. So you never get to go to sleep in hell. Just that one thing alone would be enough to endure. Uh, I was standing next to this big pit of fire and this huge inferno, you know, here on the earth, a pit filled with fire would produce a lot of light, but in hell it doesn't. It is so dark, it consumes the light. I don't know, it's like a black hole, scientists talk about, where it just draws in the light. It won't let light escape. So I could only see through the flames to see people outlines and along the edges, just barely. And all along the edges were individual pits of fire. And some people were in these individual pits. And the fire would rage up on them and burn their flesh off. And they would scream in agony. And then it would settle down and it would rage back up again. And that went on for all eternity. Others were in this big pit of fire and they were trying to climb out and demons were shoving them back in. But they have no strength to even climb out. And then I noticed I was, there were was snakes crawling all over everything. And there were actually spiders that looked like they were three and four feet across. That's not an exaggeration. I know I can't give you a scripture for that exactly, but in Revelation 16, 13, it talks about demons that look like frogs. In Revelation 9, uh, John describes a demon that he saw coming out of the bottom of his pit. Read that sometime. The most bizarre creature you've ever tried to, he tried to describe. So there's some bizarre things in hell. But also I noticed I was standing on a bed of maggots, solid maggots crawling all over everything and everybody.
And, you know, Jesus said, where their worm dies not, and the fire is not quenched. The word worm is the word maggot. And I never knew this, and I know this is disgusting, but bear with me. If a dead animal is being eaten by maggots, when they consume the flesh, the maggots will die. I never knew that. But that's why Jesus said, where their worm dies not, because the flesh is never fully consumed in hell. So as Job 24.20 says, the maggot will feed sweetly on thee. Is that disgusting enough? Isaiah 14.11 says, where the maggot will be spread under thee, and the worm will cover thee. Look it up in the original. It's the word maggot. The fear level that you experience in hell, you know, here we're all comfortable, but I want to get across to you the fear that you have to endure because fear has torment, the Bible says. And in hell, it's, it's fear constantly. Well, I'll share with you an experience I had so you can relate. When I was 17, I used to surf a lot. And we were surfing off Cocoa Beach, Florida. And it was a big day, and it breaks out real far when it's big in Florida. And it was about a quarter to a half a mile out, all us guys. It was about 100 guys out that day, having a great time. And suddenly, the guy next to me, a, a shark came and grabbed him and ripped his leg off. Blood all over the water. Now, all us guys were paddling, trying to get to the beach. And sharks came. They were everywhere, all around us. And I got up on my nine-foot board on my knees to get my legs out of the water. And a shark passed by. And he opened his mouth as he passed by. I saw his teeth, how big they are. And he was longer than my board. And he had stripes, so I knew that was a tiger shark. I knew something about sharks. And if you know anything about tiger sharks, they're vicious. They eat anything. And so the shark came back and bit my board right in half. Now I'm swimming in the water. My buddy was knocked off his board. And he looked at me because we're about a quarter to a half a mile out off the beach. Sharks all around us. And he says, Bill, I guess we're dead. And then suddenly that shark came back and grabbed my leg and pulled me down under the water. Now you can imagine the fear that I felt at that moment, right? I mean, maybe you haven't been through it, but you can at least mentally relate to how fearful that would be because you're completely helpless. Nothing you can do. They're so powerful. Well, that fear that I felt at that moment paled in comparison to what you feel in hell. Wouldn't even register in hell. Psalm 73, 18 and 19 says, you cast them down into destruction where they are utterly consumed with terror. I mean, you're consumed with this terror for all eternity. That's the fear level that you're at. I just wanted this to sink into you a little bit because this will give you that passion to want to witness. Nobody should go to this place. Your worst enemy, you want, want to see him there. You know, I just want to give you some scripture. I want to, I've got to say one thing about the shark. This was a miracle of God. The shark not only opened his mouth and let me go, but I didn't have a mark in my leg. That's a miracle. God was looking out for me. And I was not even a Christian then, but I got saved immediately after that. <laughs> hey, I knew there was a God. I knew that that was God that did that for me. And I've been serving him ever since, 51 years ago. Praise the Lord. God's been good to me all these years. Yeah, guys, so it's a stark warning, you know, to just people in general, but I kind of wanted it to make it about people that say that they're Christians, that made a proclamation of faith when they were younger and Hey, I'm a Christian my whole life, and just live how you want. If you live how you want, you're of the world. And Jesus called us to not be of the world. In the world, but not of the world. And uh, quickly, I did want to read the scripture, because again, bro, I just don't understand why people don't, don't like, like they think that if you just say you believe, that's it, that's it. Yeah, you need to confess it, that you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. You need to do that, but that's it. If that's all you do, and you're saved. That's false. That is a false doctrine. Don't fall for that. I mean, I'm always like, what's easier? What's easier, guys? Is it to be, be like the world? Is being like the world easy? Or being a Christian? What, what, what's easier? I would say being like the world's easier because that's what most people do. Why does the path to destruction? Most people are of the world and they live for their flesh. So, okay, now in between being a true Christian, someone that follows Christ, or just saying, that you're a Christian, what's easier? Oh, just, just proclaiming and then still doing what the world does. That's easier. I've never been a person that was just always just like, oh, I'm just going to follow the easiest path. The easiest path, that's the way to go. Hey, look, man, a lot of times things worth having are not easy. Now, not saying that Christianity, being a Christian, is the most difficult thing in the world. It's not, but it, it comes with certain things that you need to follow, that you need to adhere to. Um, that, you know, you need to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, not just by your words, but how you operate in life, you know? It's staying away from certain things, certain people, not participating in certain activities, you know, not being 
not 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 having hatred towards certain people. Jesus said that the world would know that they are his disciples, that they are his followers by by their works, by their fruit, by the way they act. Some of y'all don't act like Christians. And that's why I think the world I think I think that's why Christians have a have a bad name in the world. Because a lot of us don't represent the true God. They don't really represent who Christ is. Um, but real quick, I, I did just want to back that up with scripture. Um, you know, where Jesus was uh where Jesus was saying, you know, different seeds on the on being thrown, being sown. All these seeds were being sown, but some of them, the birds came and ate them away. Some of them were sown on rocky soil, you know. Some of them were sown among thorns, and some of them were, were sown among good soil. So basically describing the different type of people that will hear the gospel, the different type of people that will choose to believe, but really the only people that are, that are sown on good soil are going to make it. So real quick before we end it out, uh, this is Matthew 13, uh, verse 18. Um, well, let's start with 19. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. That's like the birds taking him away. This is, this is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word immediately, receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. So you're trying to tell me that those are people that don't believe in Jesus, that don't believe he died on the cross for their sins. No, they believe that, but they were just distracted by the world. And that's not how he wants us to believe. He has a certain way that he wants us to believe in or believe on him, you know? As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one, in one case a hundredfold and another 60 and in another 30. How can you refute these scriptures, this scripture? How can you go against it? Why are you twisting it? Not all you, but some of y'all. Why are you twisting it? Why are you putting your worldview on the Bible instead of, instead of letting the Bible dictate your world, worldview? You know? It's sad, and you know, that's why I wanted to make this video. But anyways, y'all, that's the video. Let me know what you guys thought about it in the comments. If you like it, go ahead and hit that like button. Um, if you got something out of it, or at least found it entertaining, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. I'd really appreciate that. If not, it's okay. I still love you. I will see y'all in the next one, okay? 100.